Well, good morning, Bryanston Bible Church. Just want to say thank you so much again to Buddy and to the leadership, just for the invitation for us, for my wife and I, to, to be in worship with you this morning. We so appreciate uh, being here. I've been so blessed already being here. I can confirm, y'all's coffee is uh, top notch. So I've experienced that. Um, but it is um, a joy to be here, and I want to just uh, thank you for uh, listening to somebody who's not from your church, um, but uh, I am somebody who loves the church and uh, really loves your church too, and I really mean that. Um, and I'm thanking you kind of boldly in advance uh, for listening to me, because today we're going to take a really deep and possibly very intense dive into a subject that is super foundational for the Christian life, but not that simple. And so with that really appealing uh, sermon intro, let me just uh, ask you, um, would you agree that figuring out how a Christian should relate to the world around them would be really important for their own spiritual health, but also important for the people around them and their experience in the kingdom of God? Would you agree that it would be important I would say absolutely important, and my conviction this morning is that an incorrect or just an uninformed view of the world around us can seriously compromise your spiritual health, but also an incorrect or uninformed view of the world in which we live could seriously compromise how people around us experience the kingdom of God. So let's get to it. What I want to unpack is what should a Christian's view of the world be, and therefore, how should we relate to the world around us? And so let's start the most exciting way, and that is with a definition. So what exactly am I referring to when I speak about the world, or to be more specific, what exactly is the Bible referring to when the word or the phrase, the world, comes up all the time? For example, in the very famous John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the question we're asking is what or who are the recipients of the divine love of God? That seems to me to be an important question, yeah? Like just who or what are these uh, beneficiaries of the divine love of God? So that's the setting. So when we read the phrase or the words, the world, in our New Testament, we are reading a translation of the Greek word cosmos. Now, I do normally try and stay away uh, from, you know, being super nerdy and mentioning Greek words all the time, but I figured this is one that sounds familiar to you, cosmos, hey? So just putting that out there, that is the word for the world. You know, you can just use that. If you're at a dinner party, you know, someone's saying, man, what's going on in the world? You can go, oh, you mean the cosmos, Greek word? So just helping you all out here. Uh, so cosmos is the word that, that we're looking at this morning, but it's a bit of a tricky one because it's used in a variety variety of different ways in the New Testament, much like our English word or phrase, the world, is used in a variety of different ways. For example, if you happen to be in a very romantic environment with a significant other and you're looking across the table from them, looking deeply into their eyes, you might say the words, darling, you mean the world to me. And then when you are drinking BBC coffee, you might be saying, this coffee is out of this world. Or if you're on that said romantic date and things take a turn for the worse, hypothetically speaking, and you're kind of, kind of getting a little heated, you might go, what in the world are you doing? You see, we use the phrase the world in a variety of different ways, and so do the New Testament authors. So here are four different ways cosmos all the world is used in the New Testament. So I'll just run through the first three of these real quick. So number one, it refers quite obviously to the physical reality in which we live. Genesis chapter one, the heading is God created the world. So that's New Testament, absolutely. Often you'll see the phrase from the foundation of the world being used as a reference for time, and that is just referring to the point at which the world was created. So just very obviously, world refers to the globe, the creation, our physical environment. That's number one. Number two, the world also refers to, not just to the physical environment, but to the inhabitants 
of that will, to the inhabitants of God's creation, i.e. humanity. Humanity. And that's, of course, what John 3, 16 is narrowing down to refer to. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever in the world believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. So John 3, 16, it doesn't mean that God does not love the creation. It doesn't mean God doesn't love animals. It doesn't mean God doesn't love the plants. It's just here it is narrowed down that the object of his affection and his love is narrowed to people. And that's very clear. It's those who can believe, the capacity to believe. Verse 90 to 21, it's those who believe, those who don't believe, those who behave wickedly, those who don't behave wickedly. So the world is not just a creation, but often refers to people. But let me be more specific. When it refers to people, it refers to all people. All humanity. Just give me one more little nerd detour here. But while the world refers to people in general, there is another word used in the New Testament to refer to people, and that is laos. But that refers to a smaller group of people. So often it refers to crowds, but most often in Scripture it refers to Israel, a particular group of people. And aren't you just happy that John 3 verse 16 uses cosmos, because it means God does not just love a certain group of people. God's love is for all humanity. Can we at least just appreciate that and understand why doing some cool nerd word studies actually are helpful? So God so loved the world. Here we are talking about humanity in general, people, not here the created environment. Number three, is that cosmos of the world refers to, this is where it gets a little trickier, refers to the way people think about the way they live their lives. So in, our, in English, think about worldview. Same thing. Worldview is specifically referring to our philosophies, our beliefs that inform our behavior. So, for example, Romans 12, the very famous Romans 12, is that essence. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it's very obvious here that the world refers to a way of thinking. You with me so far? Verse 3. Now that third one is a clue to a very, very, very common other usage of the cosmos in the scripture. And it's a clue because in Romans 12, the reference to the world and the way the world thinks is negative. What Paul is saying is do not think like the world thinks. Do not have the same philosophies. And so there's kind of a negative attachment to the way the world thinks. And so this fourth very common very important usage of the world in scriptures narrows down from humanity, narrows down from worldviews to refer to sinful humanity and broken or misguided or destructive worldviews. And just generally, this fourth usage of cosmos or the world is everything that is opposed to God that is hostile to the cause of Christ. So here's a literal Bible dictionary definition, not an Oxford one, a Bible dictionary one. Cosmos refers to the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of people alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. It's quite intense. Yeah? And, but it gives you the idea, that's the fourth use of this phrase, the world. Everything that's in our environment but that is against the cause of Christ or against the kingdom of God is called the world. Here are some examples, important examples. So from the book of James, chapter 1, speaking about religion and what real religion is, it says religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Can you at least appreciate that here, this is a very negative sense, here the world refers to something very much to be avoided because it will stain you. So stay away. Now it's clearly not referring to creation. 
Not saying do not go on your long run or your long bike ride. I love bicycle riding. So it does not mean if you go into nature, you're going to get polluted by something sinful. No, it's this, this is not referring to creation. This is not referring to humanity in general. Never leave your house because if you come into proximity with another human being, you're going to get stained. It's not referring to that, right? It's not referring to worldviews because there's behaviors there. So it's something else. And the something else is this idea of everything in the environment in which we live that is against or hostile to uh, the cause of God and his kingdom. Here's another verse, James 4, verse 4. Starts out and says, You adulterous people. And you know that's never going to be good, what follows. Do you not know? Now just listen to this. Do you not know? Do you not know? And the purpose of the sermon is sometimes we forget. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. So therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world, whoever wishes to be friendly with the world, makes themselves an enemy of God. So here, again, can you just appreciate, the world is referring to something that is so opposed to God that if you align with it, you're opposing, yourself. You're opposing God uh, yourself, and that's not going to be a good thing to do. And again, that's not creation, that's not humanity in general, that's not generally worldviews, it's referring to everything in the environment we live that is opposed to or hostile to the ways of God. Now hear from John, the Apostle John in his letters. So he's saying the same thing, but in different language. So 1 John 2 verse 15, do not love the world. Does that mean don't love creation? Does that mean don't love people? No. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. For everything that's in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So it's the same thing as James, setting up in opposition, except here it's like the love of the Father. James is using hectic language of enemies. He has the, the love of God is absent if you love the world. And John uses it a lot in his letter, and he will effectively say, get this, when he speaks about conversion, becoming a Christian, there's many ways to talk about what that's like. But in John's language, in 1 John, he speaks of conversion as breaking free from the tyranny of the world. It's like that song we just sang about no longer slaves. John would be like, yes, that in his view, conversion is breaking free from the world. Here's the language in chapter 5, verse 4. For everyone who's been born of God, born again, a believer, if you've been born of God, you have overcome the world. And this is how, this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Isn't this beautiful? This is just good gospel time right now. Uh, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We've just sung about that. So that's this fourth use of the phrase, the world. Now I realize we have very quickly gone down a very deep and rather dark rabbit hole. And just to pull it back, what I'm saying at this point is there are at least four distinct uses of cosmos or the world in the New Testament from creation to humanity to worldviews, but it's this last one that is so common that we have to pay attention to. And as I've thought about this, and just disclaimer, this is not from Bible theologians, it's just me, I probably have more thinking to do on this, but as I've thought about this fourth usage of the world, I would describe it as the faith environment in which we live. The faith environment in which we live. Because environment speaks of the conditions that we live out our lives. That's a technical definition. What I mean is the faith environment. But it's the conditions in which we live where our faith is expressed and that impact on our faith. And make no mistake, the faith environment in which we live now and what it has always been like and what it will continue to be in the future is decidedly against 
the ways of God and his kingdom. It has always been like that. But it does, it's not everywhere. That's not everywhere. That does not mean that there's nowhere you can go. That everywhere you go, you're going to step into a place and with people around you and philosophies and beliefs that are hostile to God. Can you think of at least one place where the faith environment is not opposed to God and is in fact for God? Can you think of one? You should be able to think of one because you're sitting in it today. You are there. I mean, absolutely. Like wherever churches are gathered, you're in a faith environment that is not against God. Where actually you're being fortified in your faith with one another. And you're learning and you're singing. You're being bolstered in your faith. But everywhere else you go and live, as Christians, where you work, where you go to shop, the club you play paddle at or whatever social activities you do, is decidedly, mostly opposed to God. And that's why when John ends his letter, First John, second last sentence, verse, he says this, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So let's bring it down. What am I trying to do this morning? What I'm trying to do, the job, as I said to you, was try and understand what a Christian's view of the world should be, and therefore, how should we relate to the world? So let me ask you, when it comes to the faith environment in which we live, move, and have our being, how should we see our relationship with this faith environment? And I would say that at the very least, we should be a little hesitant. At the least, in fact, It seems, according to James and to John and other New Testament authors, that to grow in our relationship with God means actually withdrawing from, pulling away from the world. And conversely, if we are too familiar, become too complicit, too entrenched in the surrounding faith environment that can severely compromise us in our relationship with God. Is that true? I mean, yes, that's exactly what these scriptures are saying. We can't avoid this. Christians have to be very careful in their attachment to the faith environment in which they live. In very careful in what they appropriate from the faith environment in which they live, whether that's beliefs or behaviors, philosophies or practices, culture or conduct. We have to be very careful in what we take from the world and apply to our lives. And in John's words, there's a separation that occurs at conversion that's supposed to be carried out in our lives for the rest of the Christian life. And as we journey closer to God, it seems that at the same time, that's a journey out of relationship with the world. That's this fourth idea of what the world means. However, however, and aren't you glad there's a however, Because that is not all that is to be said about a Christian's posture to the world, is there? That's not all that is to be said. And that's why we have this one word that has a variety of meanings. It's not just to confuse us and give scholars and preachers something to think about. But it's because actually these meanings overlap. And so for Christians today, we have to hold intention. And please, just... Have, hang on to that. Hold in tension this very important fourth view of the world and our weariness in our engagement with it, but hold that intention with the second view of the world, which, remember, is all of humanity. And so, even though, even though the world, the environment in which we live, everything, but based around people, is a way of talking about often in Scripture, everything that is wrong and broken and ungodly, it's true. Even though the world is a way of talking about everything that's ungodly and broken and wrong, God's disposition toward it, church, God's disposition towards the world is what? Based on number two, is love. It's love. Remember, for God so loved the world, and that was 
all humanity, including even those who are caught up in the ways of the world, who are themselves living in ways that are opposed. God's disposition towards it is love. And so it's interesting, John, who's wrote 1 John with these warnings, also, you know, in his gospel, he uses the world more than any other gospel writer. Matthew uses it nine times, Mark seven times, uh, sorry, Mark three times, Luke seven times. John uses the phrase the world 57 times. And get this, it is almost exclusively when he uses the world to refer to the recipients of God's saving activity and love. And can we just take a step back and appreciate that as well? That even though what is contained in the big world, and even though as it narrows to humanity, even though it is hostile decidedly to the cause of Christ and opposed to the kingdom of God, God's heart toward it is love. Can you figure that? Can you just figure that? If someone is so against you, how is your heart towards them? But, I mean, that's another sermon for another day, but can we just appreciate that? So let me give you just a few verses to just enjoy. I won't even comment on them, but just enjoy. This is John again in his gospel when he speaks of John the Baptist who sees Jesus. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and John the Baptist said, behold, this Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the object of his saving activity. John 6, Jesus says, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. John 12, Jesus says, if anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So the world, the, the faith environment in which we live, which is the worldviews and the people and creation itself, though broken, is the recipient of God's divine love and saving activity. And so what that means is, while, please just, Try and understand this. What that means is while we, we as believers are very aware of, very weary of the world and its nature, we also see it the way God sees it, which is a place to be redeemed. Which is hard for us, isn't it? It's like we're caught. Are we supposed to be weary of it? Are we supposed to disengage? Or are we supposed to... To love it. Exactly. That's why this is complicated. But at the least what we're seeing is while we, yes, are supposed to be warned against friendship with the world, we see it the way God sees it as a place to be redeemed. And, I just have to land this last and, not only do we try to see it the way God sees it, we recognize that we are called to be agents of His redeeming activity in it. And the Bible speaks about that a lot, doesn't it? So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in just one verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. We just get that. It's different. Different. The old has passed away. It's gone. Behold, the new. It's a new life, a new world. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What is that ministry? Well, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and, and, and entrusting to us the same message of reconciliation of the world. And therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. So to try and help, because the last thing I want to do is to leave you confused today. So to at least try and help understand this tension. And even if you just get that it's a tension, you're 90% there. But to try and understand this tension, let me give you two words that I think are helpful in describing a 
Christian's view of the world around them. Firstly, the first word I think is helpful is the word we are separate. A new creation. All this possible. So we're separate. Why I like the word separate is it has this idea of distinct, but different. And by the way, there's a whole other rabbit trail that we could go down that I, don't, I won't do today. But the word holy, in essence, means separate. I said so separate is this beautiful word. So we are to be separate, but not separated. Now, I don't know that those words may mean different things to you, but in my mind, the difference is separated means isolated, withdrawn, disengaged, uninterested, insulated. Are Christians supposed to be completely hiding out in the back room, never engaging with the world? No. That was an easy answer. Y'all. Was, no. <laughs> separate, but not separated. Other word that I think is helpful is the word set apart. It's a good word. Set apart means kind of designated for a special purpose. You set apart this cutlery and crockery for the really good guests. Designated for a special purpose. That's good. That's a good thing. Christians are to see themselves as set apart for a noble purpose, but not set against. To be set apart does not mean to be set against. And again, in my mind, set against implies animosity, hostility. Like this Christian culture war, you know, like do we're going to be like hostile. Set apart, distinct, different, but not set against. I guess one other way to think about it, again, to just not be confused, is not just think of a Christian's view of the world, but think about how should the world view Christians? How should the world view Christians? I'll tell you, when the world thinks of Christians who are living in this tension, the world should be very confused about us. Because on the one hand, they would go, like, man, these guys, like when a Christian moves into the neighborhood, people should benefit. They, they should see our love and our kindness and our generosity and our patience. They should see our ethics that are so different and that are wholesome and good. They should look at Christians and go, well, we're so glad they're here on the one hand. But on the other hand, they should be like, they're weird. <laughs> they don't behave like we do. They don't think the way we do. In fact, their beliefs are very opposite our beliefs. And let's be honest that does lead to a certain amount of tension and hostility. So when the world thinks of Christians, they should be confused. They should be like, do we love them or do we hate them? Exactly. If that's what they think, we are living in the tension of being set apart but not set against, of being separate but not separated. I guess ultimately what I'm saying this morning is that the relationship between a Christian and the world is interesting. And we need to be aware of the complexity of this relationship. And so as I, as I end, I have two exhortations for you. These aren't even applications. Just two exhortations for you. After this last 30 minutes in word studies and deep dive, it all comes down to this next one minute. Two things. One, some of you, and I, and, I, and I say this not because I know you, but because I know myself, I know people, I know the people that I work with. Some of you are simply too friendly with the world and could do with some separation. You've embraced philosophies. You've embraced practices embraced behaviors, language, perhaps relationships that you should not have as citizens of the kingdom. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, the one who does the work of separating, it's time to separate. And again, I, mean, I really don't know. If this were happening in my church, people would be like, man, you listened in on, and, and, and I don't know but I know myself and I know why we have these warnings all over scripture. And the reason I wanna be so emphatic with this point is because I'm convinced that a lot of the heartache, a lot of the 
brokenness, a lot of the shame, a lot of the fear that people experience in their lives is because they are too attached to the world. And that's why there's brokenness. And so some separation has to occur. But on the other hand, there are some who are perhaps so separated and afraid, or to step back timid, maybe lazy in their attitude toward the world, perhaps even some on the other side are hostile towards the unchristian environment in which they live, and you could do with some healthy Christ-like engagement with the world. So I don't, I don't know which of these two you fall into, but knowing myself, it's either one or both could be. I don't even know if, if you really know, and it's not possible in a moment maybe even to get that, but I tell you, Jesus knows. And that's a very preachery thing to say, hey? <laughs> but I mean it. He knows. He knows the tension. And he's trying to draw us in the one way out and on the other hand lead us in. He gets it. And I know that because there's a prayer that he prays for his disciples in John 17, just before he dies. And that prayer is such an important prayer for us because he says it's not just for you guys, but for every other Christian who's going to live, which is us in the room today. And this prayer beautifully weaves together this tension. And so I want to pray this as a prayer. So let's maybe just end that now and just invite you to bow your heads as though we're praying. I mean, maybe you want to see the screen so you can see these words. But it was a prayer Jesus prayed, and I just think it's the perfect prayer to help us with this tension. So let's pray. Jesus says in this prayer, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. And that's us today, church. That's us today. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. So, Holy Father, keep them in your name, those you've given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them, those you've given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they, us, may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, because they're separate, just as I'm not of the world. And then church Jesus prays this. He says, I do not ask that you take them out the world, that they be separated but I do ask that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified, made separate in truth. Oh, Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning and I can only offer to you these exact words that you prayed yourself for your disciples that we know you said were for us today, right now, these same words. A prayer just helping us to know what parts of our lives have become overly familiar with the world around us and also knowing that sometimes we're too timid or afraid to engage. And I pray this morning, Jesus, do that for this good family here at Bryanston Bible Church and for this church 
that you help us be distinct and separate by your Spirit. Convict us. At the same time, point our eyes to your sacrifice, Jesus, so we can be cleansed, that your Spirit can grow in us and sanctify us. Help us to be separate. At the same time, help us, we pray. This church all the good churches in Joburg, all Christians, help us meaningfully engage with the broken world around them. I pray these things. In your name, following your exact words, Jesus, we trust you to act.